So I just got a question for you this morning. For some of you, does, does this bring back a memory of your childhood? And, I, and I'm not talking about mama's cooking. See, I said so funny. As soon as I bring this up here, some of you, this, this is a memory that is right there, right? And, you know, if, if, if you sassed mom, you got whacked, you know? If, if you hit your brother, you, you got whacked. Um, you may grow up in a family like mine. If you, your mouth got out of hand, um, somebody decided to clean it. They didn't use a wooden spoon. They used soap because that's what you use to wash things. Isn't that right? You know? And, you know, discipline is difficult. I, it's difficult to give. It's difficult to receive. And it's essential for us. It's essential for us as adults who are still children. It's essential for us who are adults that we would share this with our children, with our grandchildren. We are coming into a generation that is rejecting the principles of God on every hand. And so as we're walking through this together as a family, looking at the foundations, today we're going to be talking about this idea of parenting with discipline, okay? And I want us to take a look at the Word of God to discover and be reminded again of God's plan for His kids. That's us. How we would be discipled and that we would then know how to disciple our children and our grandchildren. So talking about this idea of parenting with discipline, I think based on my experience, now we're not all the same, okay, but based on my experience, we have oftentimes reacted to the extremes rather than responded to the truth. And many of you grew up saying, I will never do that to my children, you know. And then you heard your mother's voice or your father's voice coming out of your mouth when you were talking to your own children. So the idea of discipline is for children and for adults. So turn with me, if you would, to Hebrews chapter 12. And there's pew Bibles there in front of you or chair Bibles. If you want to use one of those, um, 925 is the page for Hebrews chapter 12. Love for you to stay with me. So last week we were on this subject of teamwork in parenting. And um, we were in Ephesians 6, 4. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. And we talked about the fact is that you can't interact with your children in a way that frustrates and demotivates them. And he says, don't do that. And then there's a tendency because of that, I think, to say, okay, I, I don't want to frustrate my kids. So then we pull back too far. And do nada. You know what I'm talking about? Okay, every time there's something that happens and this creates this, so we step back. So I want us to look at this idea, you know, this discipline and instruction of the Lord. Most of us, we think of instruction, we say, okay, I understand that. I, ne I need to be sharing the word of God with them. I need to be sharing the principles of the word with them. But when it comes to discipline, it can be challenging to talk about. So what does the discipline of the Lord look like? So here in Hebrews chapter 12, he talks about it. And brings it out in some details. Now he starts this chapter off with a picture of a race. And then he moves into a picture of a family. And so there's several sermons in this text. But I'm only going to give you two of them. Okay. So, so the first one will be the, the, the flyby overview of the first three verses. And then we're going to settle in on verses 4 to 11. To look at what does it look like to be a family of God. And to follow his principles. So let's just, I'm just going to read this out loud to you. He says, therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him. 
Consider him who has endured such hostility by sinners against himself so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. There are times in this world when we grow very, very weary. The author was writing to Hebrews saying, hey, they were struggling with, are we going to stay in the faith even? And today there are people getting disillusioned with how life is going. God's not doing things the way I want. He says, hey, you need to do some things. And he lists three here that, number one, it's important to realize that God has a race for you to run with endurance. See, some of you would have took better care of your body if you knew you were going to live this long. Okay? And, and the fact is, though, some of you, if you'd have known how the tests were going to be, you'd have spent more time developing your spiritual faith. And here you are now, and you're like, oh, God's got this race. And he says here in that verse that you're to run with endurance, having laid aside sin and encumbrances. All right, he says, so there's that running with endurance requires removing the things that entangle you. Now, endurance means there's, I mean, entangles, sin is, is the pretty obvious things, okay? We, we recognize, hey, that, that God said no, I'm not supposed to say yes to something God said no. God said to say yes to it, then I need to say yes to it. That part, see, the idea of encumbrances is always, not always so obvious. Um, ran cross country for Del Norte High School in my senior year, and you know, it was never warm for a cross-country race. Uh, at least it just never seemed like it. it. It might have been one day. But usually we were down running and oftentimes on the ocean. And uh, when it came time for the race, it could be pouring down rain. Didn't matter. Nothing changes. You're going to go run. But are you going to keep your warm sweats on? No. Because it's going to slow you down. It's not illegal to run in sweats. It's just going to make you slower. And there are things that God has given you that may be permissible in your life. But if you're going to run with endurance, sometimes there's things we have to lay aside and say, hey, that's not helping me get farther. And so that's this principle there. And then he says, fixing your eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. That we would be people who are totally preoccupied with Jesus Christ. And so focusing on Jesus is essential to running the race with endurance. That you would continually turn yourself. This is not a self-help program that I'm preventing. It's the idea that Christ train, changes us as we trust him. And so he must be our focus. And so all three of these are interesting enough. I've never seen it this way before. But all three of these are foundational to the issue of being a parent who would discipline with godliness. That you got to endure. Um, children take it out of you, do they not? Can, can I hear an amen from a parent on that? Okay, they, they take it out of you. And, and so, and there's things that are going on in your life. Sometimes it's from your past. I realize that I'm, I'm going to be kicking cans from people's past today. That's okay. Let's throw them out. But there's things that will that'll stress you. When all of a sudden your child starts doing something and it brings something back to you that you haven't necessarily resolved. And then that focusing on Jesus, that we would continue to not just get preoccupied with our children or our grandchildren, but that we'd be preoccupied with Jesus and seeing him translated into the lives of our children. So that's a, a key issue. So believer, I want you to understand and remember afresh that the focusing on your relationship with Jesus is going to transform every other relationship that you have. Every other relationship flows out of your walk with Jesus Christ. So if you want to see a relationship grow, it, don't skip the Jesus thing. <laughs> see, some people say, oh, I, I really got to go work on my marriage, so we're not coming to church for a while. <laughs> oh, I, I, I really got to work on my parenting, so we're not. And, and people will skip taking care of themselves in the spiritual core to try and work on the external. No, the core determines what's going to flow out of you. So I want to encourage you with that. All right. So then he moves on from the race to the illustration of the family. 
talks about this hostility that, that they were encountering, that the church he was writing to, that the Hebrew Christians were under great persecution. Uh, many of them had lost their homes. Some were in jail already. And so he's writing to them, and he says, interesting, in verse 4, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding blood in your striving against sin. You're not bleeding yet. <laughs> and uh, he says, and you've forgotten the exhortation which was addressed to you as sons. It's my son. And now he's quoting here from the Old Testament, the book of Proverbs. Do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor faint when you are reproved by him. For those whom the Lord loves, he disciplines and he scourges every son whom he receives. Now it's for discipline that you endure. God deals with you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? But if you are without discipline, of which we have all become partakers, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. And furthermore, we had earthly fathers to discipline us, and we respected them. Shall we not much rather be subject to the Father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time as seemed best to them, but he disciplines us for our good that we might share his holiness. And all discipline for the moment seems not to be joyful but sorrowful. Yet to those who've been trained by it, afterwards it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. So here's this picture of this process. He says that we are in as believers with the Lord. He is going to be involving you in this process of discipline. And so discipline is an essential part of God's process for producing maturity. And everybody says, hallelujah, right? No, we, we don't like that aspect, but that's the reality. So I'm going to share some things today. I have to teach you things that you may not want to hear what I have to say. That's okay. I don't always like everything God says to me. I still know it's true. See, I still know it's what I want him to be doing in my life, even though it may be difficult. And so discipline is this essential part of God's process for producing maturity. So I don't want to stay a baby. I hope you don't. No. I can still remember years ago, 30 almost, when I came here and I had some lady tell me, she says, oh, I just love sitting under the word and just like being fed like a little baby bird. Just give me the truth in this. And I wasn't thrilled with that concept and they were rather shocked when I said, I don't mind feeding babies that are babies. It's when I have to push the whiskers back to put the bottle in that it bothers me. See, you can grow old and still be a child. You have to choose to respond to maturity if you're going to grow up in Christ. And so it's a key thing. And, and, and I want you to understand, God has a plan for you. And I don't care how old you are. I don't care what you're going through. If you still got a pulse, God's still got a plan. All right? And so, so there's something he wants to do in our lives. And the purpose, he points this out in here. Did you see that? He starts off talking about discipline, and he ends up saying it's going to yield the peaceful fruit of righteousness. The purpose of discipline is development, not punishment. Well, I, I hope you can get this because because I was, I know my parents were wanting to develop me, but as a child, it sure seemed like an awful lot of the time. The point was that I was going to have righteousness extracted upon me, so I'd never do that again. As opposed to that, I would become the person. God wants me to be. Parents, as you discipline your children, I want you to, to be doing this in a way that invites them into maturity with Christ. It invites them into, it's a, it's a, de it's a development, okay? And so 
we take time to interact. I think that is one of the key factors for parenting is that when you're applying correction in your child's life, that you take the time to go over the issues before you may apply some of the, the, the discipline. So there are some deceptions that I have found in our culture. And um, I was looking some of this up just the other day again on the Internet, and I'm just going, you've got to be kidding me. So I'm, I was going to tell you, these are things that people say about the Bible or say about God's perspective. And um, I just say, I'm going to put it out there. And this, this, this one well, it may surprise some of you, but it says, the Bible doesn't say anything about spanking. Okay? There are people, that's, that's what they say. The Bible, the Bible says absolutely nothing about spanking. And I, I actually went to a couple of different websites that were proposing this. And it's very interesting to watch how they retranslated words of Scripture and, and if you understood the original language here, it means this and this and this. And if you understood, you know, we are graced to be given amazing translations in English in your Bible. And if it makes sense, use common sense, lest it becomes nonsense. Okay? So we'll get into this a little bit more. Then, then there's other things. This, this is shocking, but you will hear other people say this, is that physical abuse of children is Biblically permissible. Hogwash. That is abhorrent to God. That children would somehow be treated poorly as a way of drawing them towards God. That is wrong. And we're going to go into that. Um, and then, in between, there's those people who think that, that spanking is the only acceptable means of correction. That if, if, if a child disobeys, spanking is what happens. Now, it kind of seemed like that as a child to me. But as I thought back on it, I did realize there was some groundings and some other disciplinary activity that took place. But, it, you know, when you're a child, sometimes you just feel like that's the only thing that ever happens is spanking. But that's an incomplete view from Scripture as well. So we're going to walk through some of those things and just point out some stuff as we do. But I want us to have a perspective about discipline because <laughs> when some people hear discipline they hear hit okay that's not what the scriptures say okay that's that is not the only perspective or what does it mean to bring a child into maturity because discipline has in it the in insight of training a child all right and doing it in a way that that corrects that educates that shapes them towards maturity so that you're going to do things that will influence them to make and understand the right choices. And so it's here he says, I want you to understand, he says, you should not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord or faint when you are reproved by him. And so he goes, bam, bam. Two, different, two different perspectives. He says, I, I want you to understand when you see God's discipline in your life that you would not regard it lightly. In other words, he says that you would not dismiss it, that you would not say, doesn't matter, that you would not value it, okay? He says, don't, don't regard it lightly. Don't, don't think that this is an insignificant thing. Now, I'm talking to adults here, and that's who the book was written to. He says, I don't want you to think about God's correction in your life as a light thing. It's a heavy thing. You, you read the rest of Hebrews chapter 12, and you will see the heaviness of God's discipline in people's lives, all right? So then he also says, don't faint when you're reproved by him. So then the other side is, oh, it's too much. I can't take it, okay? So you just quit, all right? I, I, I'm not going to, I just give up, all right? So, so discipline is something that can be devalued or discouraging, all right? When God's working in your life, there's times you say, it doesn't really matter. I don't care what God thinks. Read the book of Jonah. You might develop a little different idea about God's discipline, you know. Um, but Or you can be very discouraged by it, saying this is so difficult. This is so painful. And so, you know, one of the challenges that I had as, as a coach um, is that, uh, well, I coached wrestling some and that was a natural for me because I was a wrestler for many years but when I went to coaching soccer okay 
When I was first assigned soccer coaching in this town, I did not even know the basic rules of soccer. I had to go down and get a set of rules and go, okay, I'm supposed to do this because the coach didn't show up one day, um, the very first day, and never thereafter. And so my son and 12 other kids were running around in the field, and I said, somebody should be taking care of these kids. <laughs> so that was my introduction to about 10 years of coaching. But what I found in coaching was is that I could – exercise discipline quite well. I had to draw in other people who had the skill sets of how to execute the plays that were required for soccer. But it's something to, to look at and say, hey, do we value what God's doing in your life? Are you discouraged by that? Because there's an intention of how he's working. And so it says in Proverbs 29, 15, that God wants us to get this, so let's read it together. The rod and reproof give wisdom, but a child who gets his own way brings shame to his mother. Now, I'm not sure why mothers get picked on in this particular verse, you know, but you guys all know how that works. Is it your child? <laughs> you know, parents tend to do that back and forth with each other. But he says, the idea that applying physical discipline or applying verbal correction, the point is, is that you're going to give them wisdom. Is that the point in your home? Are you working intelligently, deliberately, intentionally to see that your children, your grandchildren, or even your great-grandchildren become wiser? That is something that's a, a worthwhile investment. And so, but when he brings in the idea of the rod, um, it's interesting. People say, well, that, that wasn't, wasn't ever used on people. Well, you read Paul's testimony, how many times he was beaten as an adult with the rod, okay? So, but you don't do that with infants. We need to have this balance that, that, that the idea of applying discipline ought never, never to bruise, ought never to shame, ought never to be done in this outburst of anger rather than having this discussion that's going to bring wisdom. At the same time, <laughs> the consequences of discipline <laughs> should be powerful enough to create a desire to avoid it. Okay? When your child's laughing at you about what you're doing, you are not doing it right. Okay, now that does not necessarily mean you apply more pain because I, I watched a sibling of mine and there was no problem in his body to taking pain. I used to always look at him and go, you know, there's an easier way to do this. <laughs> and, and he would get thrashed because, you know, in the middle of correction, he would speak back to the parents and then it would get worse and, and there was just no end. And so it's important to understand as we do this that, that we want to develop wisdom. So when God's working in your life, I'm going to pull this back and forth on you. This may, may be like whiplash, okay, parenting and you, and you. When God's working in your life, don't quit. When it's difficult, don't quit because you get corrected. I do not enjoy being corrected. Do you? I don't think anybody does. I don't think anybody's like, oh, well, thanks. You, you did that wrong. Thanks a lot. Okay? So, so, but don't quit because of that. He actually talks in here that the father, those whom the father loves, he disciplines. And then it actually says he scourges every son whom he receives. I couldn't find anybody who could find a translation that took out scourging. Okay? Scourging was what the Romans did with adults with a whip, all right? So he says, God actually works so painfully in our lives sometimes, it may feel to us like we're being abused. I find many people who, who if that's the way God's going to work, I'm done, okay? Now, be alert to this issue, friends, because <laughs> at times I find God giving credit for things that's not God's. All right? It's like, you know, I was 
driving to town the other day, and I can't believe it. God's so mad at me, I got a ticket for speeding. You know, that's not God punishing you. That's called consequences, okay? You know, you jump off a third-story building without the parachute or the power glide or whatever you got, it, you're going to hit the ground too hard. That's not God throwing you to the ground. You threw yourself off. Okay, and the consequences of our choices come. But one of the great disciplinary acts that parents can do is to let consequences come, to not interfere with the consequences. I'm talking sometimes to parents whose children are 40 years old and they're bailing them out and they're doing this and they're doing that and they're taking care of them. Well, I couldn't let that happen. Why not? You see, one of the reasons we have to let pain come into children's lives is because this world is painful. And that they need to realize that if they make wrong choices, that there are going to be painful consequences. And discipline brings that into the awareness of a child at a young age. And so that's kind of the thing there. He said in Proverbs 29, it will give them wisdom. It will help them understand. All right? But there's dangers with discipline. Okay, and they go both ways again, and I'm going to throw a couple in here. One of them is that disobedience is not diligently di disciplined. Is that people just say, it really doesn't matter. That's just Johnny. That's just the way he is. No, that's the way he is because you have not applied adequate discipline. It's a job horrible situation that many of our public school teachers are put into and now it's many of our first responders are put into our law enforcement are put into because children never learn to respect authority because someone didn't provide adequate discipline and so they're talking back to someone they ought not to talk back to you and there's no awareness there's literally no awareness parents that's our job this is our calling that, that we would adequately discipline, okay? And then, in fact, in the Bible, it's, it's, it's in there. It shows it again and again and again, failures of parents. It, in fact, actually, the examples of Scripture about parenting are generally negative. Generally negative. Um, Adonijah, shortly before he met his demise had decided, I'm going to be king. Now, his father was king. His father was very old, but he decided, you know, dad's not getting the job done. I'm going to become king. And he appointed the chariot people to run with him. He appointed, he got a, a party together. He planned this whole party. <coughs> and interesting, you can read it in First Kings sometime. First Kings, the, the first chapter, it says in verse 1, it says, and David had never said, had never crossed him saying, why did you do this in his life? Now, you understand, parents, that when you ask why, you will never get an answer that will thrill you from your children. That's just not how it usually comes out. But there does need to be the accountability that says, hey, what were you thinking? And, of course, you guys already know the usual answer is, I wasn't that's what parenting is trying to do. You're trying to teach them to think before they act. That's called wisdom. Isn't that right? And so, so David didn't do it. You can read that story on your own. But the other one, and I think a lot of us grew up with this. I don't know. Maybe it's just because that's what I grew up with, is the discipline out of anger rather than love. That when a child defies you, it irritates the parent. True story? Man, it's just like, come on, we have covered this so many times. And our flesh, this is not your spirit, friends, our flesh will rise up and there is this wrath towards the child for making that choice. There being a child. Susie was really good with me. My children lived because they had a nice mother. Okay, that, that, that's, how, that's how that worked, okay? But, but, you know, when we were going along with children, she'd say, boy, they sure are acting like a four-year-old today, aren't they? You know, and the child was four. You know, it's just that little, come on, James, realize what age they're at because you can have expectations that are unrealistic and then react inappropriately. 
but so often there's a reaction rather than a choice to shape. And so what I would say is when defiance has occurred, do you take the time to talk it through before you apply the discipline that needs to be given so that you would be in the right spot? Um, sometimes we call it tag team. Now, now there's become professional wrestling tag team, and that's not what we're talking about. Okay, what we're talking about is, is that there's certain times when one spouse has reached the end of their current level of endurance, and they tag team the other and say, um, could you go deal with your child? <laughs> okay. But the point was what? Is that you want that the child to continually get this response of love in the correction. So you're not going back to, well, I'm just, I'm so tired of it, I'm not going to discipline them. You're not going to, I'm just going to go pour out in wrath upon them, but that I'm, I'm going to be thinking about this. And then if you have the strong-willed child, and if you have more than two, you have one. Okay, it just pretty much works out that way from what I've been able to tell. And sometimes they can continue, it's, it's not like in every other, okay, it, it can multiply. I'm not, not saying nothing about my family, but just some experience that I've had. But <laughs> there is oftentimes also a, de a deception about thinking that the pain applied equals learning has been received. Or that the more pain applied means more learning is received. Don't get yourself caught up into this situation where you're just cranking down when a child's not in a place they're going to receive. There's nothing wrong with saying, you know, we're going to deal with this in a couple hours. Why don't you just take some time in your room and you cool down and think through what's the most creative way to draw this child towards maturity. And if you got teenagers and you're not having fun with it, you're not doing it right. Okay. It, it, it should be. You're smart enough as an adult to be thinking this thing through, saying, hey, how do I stay ahead of the curve? So that my kids were always looking at me like, where did you come up with this? That's okay. I'm, one of our guys was sharing the other day that he got suspended from school. And he says he thought, oh, this will be great, man. I get a day off from school. Not with his mama. He says, I was mowing the yard during school with scissors. <laughs> Be creative, friends. That's what I'm telling you. Make them, give them an opportunity to do. I, somebody else here in this church, actually, I, I remember this. Is the, he sent him out to dig out stumps. Hey, we're going to deal with this problem. You're going to go dig stumps. You ever dug a stump? You do not get a stump dug out in a day. It's a process, okay? But that's what discipline is. It's a process. And so we need to understand that children respond to discipline very, very differently. Not every child responds to the idea of corporal correction well. Right? And some don't really need it at the same level. Others, you know, I pretty much had to have some wisdom smacked into me at times. That was just kind of the kind of person I was. But that, that wasn't the way my brother was. And I had two. So what, one, anyway, we won't go there. Choices bring consequences. Parents, it is your job to make sure that that principle is firmly, clearly, absolutely understood biblically and culturally. If you make a choice, there's going to be a consequence. You don't get to choose your consequences. You get to choose your choices. And that your children would know that as they grow up. And so it requires diligence. Proverbs 13, 24. Let's say this one together. He who withholds his rod hates his son, but he who loves him disciplines him diligently. I was well loved as a child, okay? That, but that idea that you will not let disobedience go undealt with. God gives you the responsibility of choosing uh, what level of application correction comes. But withholding, he says, is what? What does he say it is? Hating. What? See, we live in a culture that says, hey, just let them go. You know, they'll figure it out eventually. You know what that says? I don't care about you and your future enough 
to be inconvenienced in my presence. Because discipline, children, is very inconvenient. Because they act out at the time you least want them to. Isn't that right? Is that, so, so disciplining deals with it. It says, I care enough about you that you can embarrass me in front of my friends or your friends, and we will deal with it. Because I care. All right? But then he says here, he says, the disciplining equals love. He says, I do care. I care enough about what's going to happen in your future. And I just think we got to keep pushing the future concept with your kids. So they understand that what you're doing right now is not for right now. It's for their future. So remember when, when we were, lived in Nevada, we lived right next to a prison. And uh, we held youth group at our, at our house. And we were outside doing different things. And I was teaching one night. And, and I said, hey, what's, what's that over there? You know, and they go all like, that's a prison, James. Can't you tell by like the size of the fences? You know, and I'm like, yeah. I says, why do people go to prison? And they go, oh, for robbery or for killing people or for. I says, no, actually, they go to prison because they never learn to obey their parents. And they're like, no, no, they don't put people in prison for disobeying their parents. I says, no, you didn't hear me. You go to prison because you never learn to obey authority at home, and you won't obey it out at home. And so, parents, it is our responsibility for this society to thrive that parents will bring up their children to respect authority, and that is something that parents have to bring across. And so, discipline is a display of love that's given to instruct, okay? So when you're encountering difficulty in your life, say, hey, God, what are you teaching me? As opposed to, why are you doing this to me, God? Remember, I've told you, the why question seldom gets a great answer. You won't like it. But if you ask him, what do you want to teach me? I can always learn from that. Okay? And so God's practice is generally to get our attentive focus. Have you read the Old Testament? God had some pretty creative ways to... Deal with grumblers. Go check that out in Numbers chapter 11 sometime. Say, hey, God doesn't like complaining. Parents, you shouldn't put up with it either, okay? But what you're doing is you're bringing something into their life. God brings stuff into our lives that will cause us to say, what's next? What, what am I supposed to be getting? How am I supposed to be acting? And um, it's different for different people, <laughs> You know, our boys grew past us in height. It's always interesting trying to apply discipline when a child is larger than you. And usually by that time, you know, you're kind of out of some of that corporal correction. But my wife had a finger that could get a teenager's attention when it was planted in their chest. I watched it again and again. You said, oh, and they just knew, oh, oh. It's not the size of the mother, it's the size of the heart. It's the size of the heart. But we're going to go after it with our kids and um, teach them choices have consequences. All right? Because real life does. All right? So here's a question to ask yourself if you've got children at home, particularly if they're moving into the older age. They're, they're, they're still at home, but it, does my child expect consequences? If they disobey. Every time. There have to be the same consequence. But do they expect consequences? Because if they don't. I think you're not. Being diligent. Because in life. Every choice has a consequence. Like a friend of mine used to tell me. I always thought it was the strangest thing. It took me a while to figure it out. Because he'd said it more than once. And finally I just asked him. What do you mean? He says. He says. Gravity. Absolute best teacher. Best teacher. Gravity is a teacher? I didn't know gravity was a teacher. He says, yeah, because gravity always enforces the rules on everybody. True? True. It always happens. You, you can try it, try to fight in gravity. It's going to happen, okay? And, and that's what parenting is. It needs to be this consistency. But the point of it is receptivity, Okay? So, so, so follow with this with me. He says, verse 18, If you are without discipline, of which we've all become partakers, then you're illegitimate children and not sons. Okay, that's that love thing. He says, if you're part of the family, you're going to get it. 
all right? Furthermore, we had earthly fathers to discipline us, and we respected them. Shall we not much rather be subject to the Father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time as seemed best to them, but he disciplines us for our good that we might share his holiness. Here's that second principle. That accepting God's discipline allows us to develop godly discipline, godly maturity. Accepting God's discipline. You see, you do not mature just because you get disciplined. Can any parents say true story to that? True story. Your parents could have applied it and applied it and applied it. That does not mean you got it. And so that's a, a key thing for us. He says, hey, are you receiving it? God wants to produce holiness in our lives. I need to be a person who's receiving what he's applying. Because correction, he says here, is actually showing you belong to me. See, there, there was no doubt who was in charge in our family. There was no doubt that, that I knew I, I belonged, okay? And I belonged to be obedient, okay? That, that there was a plan for us. It was always funny, you know, six kids in the family would go grocery shopping, you know, like little ducks walking behind mom, you know, and behind the cart. You just, just, you obeyed. Now, when we got home, it was chaos, okay? But people would come up and say, man, yeah, your children are so nice and so obedient. And I thought, if you only knew how much it cost us to get this way. God loves you. And discipline and correction in your life is God telling you, you belong. All right? Discipline is for everyone who belongs to God. He says, in which we all become partakers. All right? See, the idea of discipline is not just correction. It's development, remember? So as a, as a coach, when I would have them running extra laps, what was I doing? I was developing them. Was it painful? Yes. Was it corrective? Not really. It was developing them to be able to give me 60 minutes, okay? 90 minutes. This is what I want. I want you to be out there and give me the full turn of, of the clock on the pitch, all right? So conditioning was there. So if you allow a child to run free, uncorrected, all right, they will feel not cared for. In fact, the Bible says undisciplined children feel abandoned. And time and time again, as I have talked to, to kids who were let go at an early age by their parents, this is exactly what they tell me. Oh, dad quit about 12. Mom and dad didn't care after I was 16. I was able to do whatever I wanted. And it did not feel like love. So it's important to understand that, all right? That God is wanting us to, to come together, all right? And so he says in verse 9, this is great. We had earthly fathers that discipline us. We respected them. Can anybody say true? Say true. Now, we may not have agreed with them. See, you didn't always agree with them, but you respected them. Now, this may hurt some of your feelings, but your goal is, in their children, are, is not to be their friend, it's to be their parent. Friendship's common. If they respect you, you can build it in later as adults, but there has to be this accountability to do what is told in the household, and God says the same thing. He says, if you're not going to do what I've told you to do, I will bring adequate consequences into your life. So discipline produces character when it's received. I have to, is, am I going to let God tell me how to live my life? See, some people find resentment with that. God knows. He's a good father. He knows what's best. Seemed best seemed best has anybody looked back over your parenting and said wasn't best yeah oh yeah it, it seemed best and so here here's a point i want you to to work on i talked to you guys about this last week some of you need to talk to a child and say it seemed best i can look at it now and say it wasn't please forgive me and others of you need to Look to the parent, whether they're with you anymore or not, and say, 
I forgive you. That the cross took care of what that parent did not provide. And what I have found again and again, if you look at what they got, they gave you better. A lot of them had it worse. And so they were struggling, but it seemed best to them. Proverbs 19, verse 20 says this. Listen to counsel. Say it with me. Listen to counsel and accept discipline that you may be wise the rest of your days. Try that one on your children. That's a great thing. Hey, you know what? Just listen to me. You can get wiser. You can get fun. God says, if you'll listen to me, some of you can look back and go, man, I have wasted so much time. Okay, then let's stop today. See, let's deal with it now. Let's not say, I'm going to give another decade away, wasting myself, not doing what God's told me to do. All right? So are you growing wiser? Is your children growing? Are your children growing wiser. Even as adults, keep investing in your children. I've got three parenting suggestions for you. These are just some things that, that uh, I have found are really helpful. Number one, as husband and wife, mom and dad, agree upon the purposes and the practices of discipline. Sit down and work this out. Because I see this is probably one of the largest conflicts in marriage. It is one of the largest reasons why people choose not to discipline is because there's a disagreement between husband and wife. And by the way, ladies, if you want your husband to be the leader of the home, don't be running him down in front of the kids or undermining his authority. He will step out of that fight any time. Men are not supposed to beat up women. You don't fight, so they'll just withdraw. And you go, I wonder how come he doesn't stay in. Well, because he doesn't want to fight about it. So, and men will always discipline different than women. They're supposed to. Don't expect him to handle it the exact same way you do. But just make sure we're both addressing the same issues, and we're working towards the same goal when we get done. Okay? Second, use Discipline to teach truth and consequences. Agree upon those things. What are the things we want to see produced in our children? What's the truth? What's the consequence? And to get those things out clearly across. Third, now this will rattle some of you, okay? Allow, and this is at an age, okay? All this stuff has to be tuned to the age of your children. But allow respectful disagreement to develop maturity. You want a child that has to say yes to every adult in every situation. You do not. There are many twisted, wrong adults. They have to be able to say, I, I don't feel right about that. I, you want to develop that ability to speak into an adult's life truth. You want them to do it respectfully. But if they're never allowed to have an opinion different than yours and never allowed to express that, then when do they develop that ability? Okay, think this thing through, okay, there's, there's limits, but, but we allowed our children to come back and say, hey, I don't think, you know, and a lot of times as parents, you don't want to do this because it's going to take too long. <laughs> you don't want to do this because, you know, it don't matter what excuse or what reason they come up with, I'm not changing my mind. That's not the point. Let them talk. That's called respect. Listen your children. That doesn't mean you have to change your mind how you discipline. But you need to listen. And they should know that they were listened to. And it will help them grow and develop maturity. All right? And then think about it. Is your correction drawing them back towards the Savior and towards a relationship with you? Or is it pushing them away? See, God corrects us to draw us in. See? That's what he says there in verse 10. For they disciplined us for a short time to seem best, but he disciplines us for our good, that we might share his holiness. God knows what's good for us, and he wants us to develop that. And he says, all discipline for the moment seems not to be joyful, but sorrowful. And as you were being taken to the woodshed, you knew what that verse meant, isn't that right? But those of you who have taken a child to the woodshed also know what that means, because it's it's sorrowful for the parent. This, this, this should cause you sorrow. So 
But if we're trained by it, afterwards it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. If people respond to it, it can create this glorious relationship. All right? So he desires to produce in us, what did he say? Holiness. Now, this again was a spot, I think, where perhaps the lack of theological instruction has oftentimes undermined parents because they, oh, okay, I'm, I'm going to get my child to obey, and then they'll be holy. Have any of you ever got to this point where you obeyed well enough to call yourself holy? Where does our holiness come from? Trusting Jesus Christ alone. So we provide correction to children that they'd understand there's rules to follow, there's a, there's a way to behave, but we're leading them into a relationship where we recognize that holiness comes through Jesus Christ and trusting him. All right? In Titus chapter 3, it says, the fourth verse, it says, But the kindness of God our Savior and his love for mankind appeared. He saved us, not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness, but according to his mercy, by the washing of regeneration, by the renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out upon us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we might be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Holiness does not come by your good works. It comes by trusting Christ's good work. And it will produce good work in you. But it comes through faith in Christ. So in parenting, you've got to rethink that. I did not have this all straight as I raised my kids. And I think all of us kind of look back and go, man, you know, if I could do a do-over, that's what grandparenting is a little bit. You know, you, you, you could do some things different. But listen, do you know that you need a Savior? You see, the Bible says that all have sinned against a holy God, and we deserve wrath for our sin. And Jesus Christ took God's wrath upon himself that I could be forgiven. That through faith in him, I could be forgiven. And so if I want to be rescued from the wrath of God, I have to come to faith in Jesus Christ and say, I believe that Jesus Christ is God's son to save. He died in my place. He rose from the dead. Forgive me. So, so the issue of choosing to trust Christ is where holiness comes from. It's not because you got your act together and somehow you behaved well enough for God. You'll never be good enough for God. Jesus Christ was good enough for you. And you trust him alone. And so salvation is offered to you as a gift. If you've never received it, there's no better day than today. I just invite you that you would have that conversation with God. Say, I need to be saved. Please save me. It's that simple. And friends, don't let what's been going on in your world, in your culture, in your family, discourage you from following Christ. Because afterwards, it will yield the peaceful fruit of righteousness. Discipline is hard. Discipline is sad. But I push kids not to see them sweat, but to see them strong. Sweating was required. <laughs> but that's where strength came from. God is at work for good in you. Do you believe that? And there's some spots in your life you may not feel like you can say that. I just want to encourage you. Will you take that spot and bring it back to the cross and let him process? Let, he, let him show you what he wants to show you. God does not use a religious person. But he does use pain teach us lessons. And discipline is God's love for us. And, and I just got to give a warning in this kind of a sermon at this point. God loves you too much to ignore your disobedience. And if you are willfully rejecting his plans and direction, prepare for a serious spanking from God because it's coming. Consequences are coming for the choices that you are making. That can be great news because you're making good choices, or that can be horrible news because you're making bad choices. 
God doesn't always let these things come quick, either way. But God will let you learn the consequences of your choice. So I would encourage you, humble yourself before God and let God work for good in your life. And wherever you are right now, I just encourage you, would you stop doing what you know he's told you to stop? Would you repent? want that in my life and then submit yourself to God and say God do what needs to be done I want to walk your way learn to walk with God the Father knows best and it's a truth that you can apply it and it's a truth that you can accept it it's a key issue for us to apply it lovingly and diligently but also to accept it humbly and patiently. Fix your eyes on Jesus and run with endurance the race.